We're here tonight for the Milliken Lecture Series in Sustainability and Public Health, which has been funded by the Romill Foundation. And it's important because there are so many often hidden connections between what's good for the environment and what's good for public health. Previous lectures have focused on health and local food systems, on the Zika virus carried by mosquitoes in the context of climate warming, and health equity issues associated with urban heat islands. Tonight, we're privileged to reflect on environmental justice with a presentation by former state representative Harold Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell is a Spartanburg native whose journey was rooted in the fight for his own health and that of his family and his neighbors in the industry impacted Arkwright community on the south side of Spartanburg. And he'll share some of that story this evening. He served as representative to the State House of South Carolina from 2005 to 2017 after beginning the Regenesis project in 1998. It was founded as a grassroots effort to formally recognize and clean up the contaminated sites but its mission and its impact have expanded greatly due to Mr. Mitchell's passion and diligence. Today, the Regenesis Community Development Corporation has grown into a public-private partnership focused on equitable healthcare and housing outcomes across Spartanburg through economic development, bringing $300 million into the community so far. Their model for collaborative problem solving has been adopted by the Environmental Protection Agency and it's been a source of inspiration internationally, including in Korea, Taiwan, and South Africa. Harold Mitchell has been recognized with uh, numerous awards, including the EPA National Environmental Justice Award. Last year, he was appointed to President Biden's White House Environmental Advocacy Council, where he's bringing in his experience, vision, and courage to an expanded agenda. Earlier this year, he was recognized by Engineering News Record as a leader in equitable development and one of their top 25 newsmakers of 2021. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, former Representative Harold Mitchell to talk with us. Good evening. Problem, promise not to bore you to death, but uh, we're going to have a conversation to talk about uh, environmental justice and kind of give you a, a snapshot of what took place here in Spartanburg that became a model for uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And, you know, this past year, you've heard a lot with the, after George Floyd's death and social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, and folks are wondering, what is environmental justice? And this is something that i rather just walk you through what took place in Spartanburg for you to get a glimpse of the impacts of what we see across the country. And really, if you want to look at it, it's just a path of least resistance of some of the most toxic, hazardous facilities that you can think of in communities. And I might ask you, you know, why would you see a hazmat team wearing a suit, you know, in some of the facilities and some of the cleanups that you see them going out with? I mean, it's no coincidence that they put on the protective gear and respiratory devices to go in so that they don't get impacted by a lot of the toxins. But it's interesting that we've had several pictures, whether it's tribal communities, uh, Latino, Appalachian region and different spaces across the country, there have been so many pictures that you can see folks in hazmat suits and in the background, it's like where I'm standing, I've got on a hazmat suit, but you can see the kids in the background, in the playground or in their yards on the swings. And, and it's like, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And then you go back and you look and you see, you know, the cluster of problems with health, uh, rare respiratory diseases, all sorts of things that tie right into what folks are actually inundated with in the environment. So I wanna go through this with you here to show you um, first and foremost what um, inspired me, um, has inspired uh, a lot of our political candidates who've come through Spartanburg in the last two decades on both sides of the aisle. And one thing about contamination and pollution is neither Democrat nor Republican, red or blue. 
and the big thing with everybody is green. And so there's a YouTube video out that I'm going to share that sums it up that came out. One of the comedians put it out. Um, I think this was uh, earlier this week that I want to share with you. Some of you probably have seen it, environmental racism, but it sums it up so well across the country of what we're talking about of environmental racism. But the good thing about Spartanburg is where we were able to pull all of the, the, the problems and the impacts here because where I grew up was a fertilizer plant, landfill, textile mill, chemical plant, all of this is kind of like our house was in the middle of the two Superfund sites and four Brownfield sites that we were told that there was nothing wrong, no big deal, no problem or anything of that nature. So I'm gonna go through this to show you kind of the story here. And before I get started, I didn't know anything about the environment, didn't know anything about environmental justice, but it was my sickness, passing blood, throwing up blood, doctors couldn't determine exactly what was going on, there was no diagnosis, and just one day um, going to a funeral with my dad, uh, it was a decorated soldier that he was good friends with in Vietnam, and the uh, minister said, well, we've talked about all this guy's accolades for two hours, and in about two weeks, we're gonna forget it. So coming back from the cemetery, I was riding back thinking, it was like, man, they can forget him in two weeks. I haven't done anything, and they can forget me after the repass. And so I was thinking, it was like, man, what have you done to impact anything here? And later that night, Bishop T.D. Jakes was ministering on stewardship. And it was like mankind's original mandate was to steward the earth and went through all these things of where we dropped the ball. And he said, if we could just go back and regenerate the moment. And that night is where I saw that word regenesis that kind of started this whole snowball. So I want to start with showing you, this is the former fertilizer plant there in Arkwright. And let me see if I can get my little dot here. Well, it's too little. That bottom picture to the left, you can see in the distance here, that's the house that I grew up in right across the street from this fertilizer plant here. Inside this fertilizer plant, there were uh, all of what was listed, as the folks told me, that it was properly cleaned up and everything was removed out of this site. And mind you, like I said, when I was sick, I ended up going that next morning after looking at that with T.D. Jakes. And it was kind of like one of those nights. And since I'm on a college campus, you know, when you have that binge drinking that night and you pray about, God, if you could remove this from me, I'll promise I'll never do it again <laughs> kind of moments. And it was that kind of moment that I was like, man, if I could just make it through this, you know, I'll, you know, whatever. And that next morning I got up, went outside because I really couldn't get up and move around. And that morning when I went out, I looked at that fertilizer plant for the first time and it was like, you know, oh my God, you know, never saw it in that light before. And so what I wanted to do was like start at your own front doorstep. And that was the front door was this fertilizer plant. And I called because what we were trying to do was deal with a lot of the illegal activity that was going on. An abandoned site is a is an incubator for drug activity and trafficking and things of that nature because it's not patrolled. So we were trying to deal with the, the kids in and out, crackheads and trafficking. Little did I know when I made my appointment to go to the local DHEC office, I showed up and the young lady had the files on the desk. She was a new receptionist. She thought I was coming in to review the FOIA. I thought FOIA was a person. So She's looking at me and I'm trying to pretend like I know what I'm doing. She gave me the files and she's like, would you like to review these? And I was like, yes. She's like, would you like for me to make copies for you? And I was like, yes. And I was the first person to actually ever see the files on this site. And so when I started going through, it was almost like somebody slapping you in the face because this was a harmless fertilizer but everything I flipped over in the, in the pages there was talking about hazardous waste, toxic waste, and the long-term, short-term exposure. And so I was trying to figure out what was making me sick. 
And the more I began to flip the pages, it was like I be, it was like peeling an onion of you, you get one layer and then you see the next layer because my sister died and my parents always talked about her breathing and how she died. And so I was wondering, well, looking at the raw materials, was this the cause of her death? And so I went to um, Spartanburg Regional and got a copy of the death certificate and took it to a corner in Greenville. And the guy said it was sepsis omphalitis, a germ poisoning. And then I went back and I looked at the raw materials and looking at uh, my mom's sister's daughter who was in the same house, she died of the exact same thing. Then two doors down, there was another kid. So it was like three infants, young kids that had died of the sepsis omphalitis. Then I began to see on that street growing up on, everybody died of the exact same thing. There were no natural causes on that street. And so when I saw all of this stuff that was in there, and then looking at the, the waste pond at the facility, this is what they, they ended up looking at the files, and it was like over a million gallons of acid in their pond that was still left there at the site. And what they did, they took a, a backhoe and dug from the tributary to go into the pond and dug the, a little trench to Fair Forest Creek. So they dumped over a million gallons of acid from that facility into Fair Forest Creek. Now, they shut down in 1986. And 1999, when they tested it, it was still 2.8, the acidity. Now, anything under 4.7, you know, it's like all alarms and everybody's in from the state and EPA. Nothing was done, no fines, and, you know, Fair Forest Creek from that site is about three miles. So the sulfur in one of the pictures, a picture that I took was the exact same picture that was in the file of the site. This was a sulfur because they made their own sulfuric acid there at the facility, so the sulfur was supposed to be removed and taken to the proper subtitle C and D landfill. What they actually did was dumped it over the back of the fence and that's how they disposed of it. So the actual owner of the facility, which was someone local, because they listed it as an operational textile storage warehouse to keep EPA out and DHEC as the oversight on the site. But if you could see, hope I don't drop your laptop, sir. The deer prints here, that's what got the attention of folks. Not the fact that, you know, people were in this community, but it was the deer. Thank God for Bambi. Because, <laughs> and as you can see, the, how it just burned out that entire area there. So when we were meeting, um, that's when the owner of the site, we met at DHEC and was very upset with me. He was like, what do you want? And I'm like, what do you mean? I mean, you, you have something that was supposed to have been taken to a proper subtitle CD landfill, and I know it's over the back of the fence. And no, it's not. So they ordered this investigation, EPA Region 4, to come to Spartanburg to take a look at the site. That morning, they were supposed to be here at 12 o'clock. Well, I heard the track the trail is in front of the house at 7 o'clock. And so it reminded me of what it sounded like growing up with the tractor trailers there in front of the house to pick up the fertilizer. And so I called the folks at EPA to ask them, what time are you getting here? And they said, we'll be there by noon. We're leaving now. We're rounding everybody up and we'll be there. We're on our way. I'm like, well, there's a tractor trail out front, a huge excavator. And they went berserk. It's like, what in the hell do you mean an excavator? We're coming there to do a site investigation. So they said, go and just keep an eye, and we're, we're on our way. So I took my video camera, and this is before Rodney King, and I ran from the back of the house and went over on the other side of the creek and set up and started videotaping, watching this excavation take place. And so what they did, they tried to remove that sulfur there at the top. And what actually happened was when they went into the hill, it was like a big neon wall because they buried all of their sulfur there. And so when they tried to get rid of the sulfur, then they ran into their old acid plant that they buried there. And all of this is less than 
50 feet of, it was 40, 46 feet of Fair Forest Creek. And there's a seepage velocity of 50 feet a year. So by the time this place shut down in 86, and this is 1999, it's an impact of Fair Forest Creek already without dumping the acid in there. This is what the chunks of sulfur look like. They had to halt the actual removal because there was so much sulfur, they didn't realize it. And that's the fire chief who had no idea of the chemicals that was left in that facility. Now we have a volunteer fire department that's responsible for a wood structure that's over six acres, almost seven stories tall, with all of this ammonia nitrate fertilizer on the inside. Now, he's got two trucks, one you could outrun <laughs> with the volunteer department. And it's like, we can't fight this with water. We don't know how volatile this place is. And luckily, that fertilizer plant, all of the hydrants were off at the site because back then people were doing a lot of copper theft. So we had some, some creative engineering of folks that stripped the copper out of all the hydrants. So none of the hydrants worked at the site in case the fire trucks decided to get there. So if they had to hook up, they would have had to go across the tracks to a textile mill where there's a CSX rail line that runs about 22 trains a day. So if something had taken place, and I didn't say, all the transformers were on at the site. So it's like if, there's a if this is a transformer, it was as far as from here to the wall of brush over it. So luckily there was no electrical storms or anything that hit this because it was, you know, just ready to go. And I'm just showing you all of this because I want to paint the picture of the distrust that the people had in this community. Now, adjacent to that, when they wanted to look at background samples, this is the old Arkwright landfill. The city's landfill was located in the county. This is next to the fertilizer plant. There was so much garbage and debris here that the trees couldn't root. You could literally just walk up to a tree like this if it was this side and just push like the Incredible Hulk and it would just topple over, just like you see right here. It opened in 1958, shut down in 1972. Ironically though, 1973, when we tore up the Main Street Mall, there was a sidewalk from the Main Street Mall in the landfill. They had 19, you know, 73 on the, in the concrete that was buried there. So I was like, okay, you really didn't stop dumping in 72 because I see a sidewalk with 1973 in here that's in the landfill. So it's like, let's continue to do the math. So in that landfill, when EPA came in, which they said is nothing there, the first thing in a, one of the test pits that they opened was a test pit of hypodermic needles from Spartanburg General Hospital because they were trying to figure out who were the responsible parties. So 99.9% .9 of everything from the city and the county went to Arkwright. But according to the state, this landfill did not exist. Now, not my words, but you look at the repository that's here at the library, Spartanburg, uh, the downtown library, it would show you in there during the investigation, one of the persons that this couple on Sundays that would pick up from the hospital to take to the landfill, one of the 55 gallon drums they looked in that one Sunday morning was full of amputated limbs and fetuses. Because see, they didn't incinerate anything. They just took it out and dumped it. And it's not like the landfills you see today. They were literally trying to fill up a gully there in the Arkwright community. This landfill is from that wall to this wall, it's a little closer from the landfill to the backyards of the people living in that community. Now the backyards, they weren't on public drinking water, they were on well water. And so when the tests, the testing that actually took place found the exact same thing in those folks' drinking water as was in the landfill, in 2002 when that was done. And we found that there were six people that were still on public drinking water during that time and an emergency hookup had to be done immediately. And so at that time, um, playing at uh, Spartanburg High School, play quarterback, my uh, center, Joey Lassane, was here at Walford, was the chief of staff for Senator Hollings. 
And during that time, we had the um, emergency response coordinator that came into the site, gave me this, you know, you, you have to be the squeaky wheel that gets the oil here. And so during that time, he came in and basically did some of the, said he was going to do some of the testing to see if it was uh, an imminent threat. And so in doing so, um, he stated that it wasn't an imminent threat, but it's definitely a problem here. This shouldn't be. And so he was going to come back and all this that he was going to do. Well, he came back, but when he came back, he came back with a representative from IMC Fertilizer, which everybody in the community said that they went out of business in 1986. Come to find out they were the largest fertilizer producer in the world. So this representative of IMC walked with me and the representative of EPA. We walked around the site and he basically allowed me to take my video camera and tape him while he gave me all the discrepancies of what he mischaracterized on the site. And we went through and he talked about the fertilizer that you saw in the walls. That was like the same thing that you would see in the washing powders, like boric, boric acid. I'm like, okay, yes, sir. The ponds, there's nothing there. You can see that there's nothing down there, but clear vegetation. I'm like, yes, sir. Just kept going all the way through. So we finished up and he's like, are, are you satisfied? I'm like, yeah, I'm satisfied. So he left. I'm sitting there with the representative of EPA who had just told me a month ago the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And I'm, and I'm asking him, okay, are you gonna take any samples here? I'm not prepared for that. So I'm like, okay, we can go to DHEC and grab a couple of the, you know, the bags that they use for their sampling. We don't have to do that. We could just go to the, to the dollar store. We went down to the store, picked up four jars and three spoons. I automatically knew something was not good with that pitcher, four jars and three spoons. We get back to the site. He starts taking all the samples. He takes a sample, a soil sample. Then he goes down to where the actual pond was located with the same spoon. He took on one side and then he took on the other. Allowed me to get his good profile side on my video camera of how he was cross contaminating his spoon, which if something had been wrong, it was like, okay, this is not gonna go anywhere. So he did all of this and then came back and told our folks from the Herald Journal that there's nothing there. He recommends that this site go into a low priority listing and the state should take control of the site. He was used to going to these big bomb sites, these big sites with that EPA, you know, get on one of the big magazine or front pages. So he said that. I called Joey Lassane, sent him a quick letter, and Senator Hollings asked for this investigation at the site. Well, they went on with the investigation. Come to find out there were 72 contaminants detected, and 35 of those were five times above the maximum contamination level. And that's when the ball took off from there, thanks to Senator Hollings uh, helping us at that point. And it was at that point we started working with uh, EPA and conducting with the community meetings because now we've identified both the fertilizer plant and the landfill and tried to get some community awareness because this was going to be a long haul, the Superfund cleanup. So we tried to deal with expectations because people were like, wait a minute, this crap is in our backyards. We couldn't even use the landfill ourselves, but we find out we've been sitting in all this toxic crap all of this time. So it was at that point trying to you know, show the folks what the process was going to be. And many of the people that you see in there are no longer, I mean, it was shortly thereafter, a lot of the folks died, died there. And, and two, in the beginning, a lot of people didn't know that this was a problem, like environmental justice communities across the country. It's their livelihood. That fertilizer plant, that, was, that meant nothing to them. They didn't know the formaldehyde and the mercury and all these different things that was a byproduct putting into the fertilizer because what we found out during the investigation, Atlantic Station in Georgia, their hazardous waste toxic furnace dust was sent to Spartanburg because they couldn't dispose of it in Georgia. So they sent it here as a filler, came in as a toxic waste and left out as a product. They never passed their stack emissions test at this site. So when the everything that was metal in the community was basically eaten up. 
They replaced my parents' car, no questions asked whatsoever. So you tell me who's going to complain about the rust or the problem with the car, and the company's going to come back with a new car with a title saying, hey, here you go, you know. And so they did that, plus they painted cars in the community. So if this stuff was going on with metal, what do you think it was doing to the most delicate tissue in the body? But no one in the community ever connected those dots until I had the first meeting after a lot of this stuff was going on prior to this. And there was a lady that stood up in that meeting and really it was Mayor Talley's meeting that I took over when he was running for re-election. And a lady stood up and said, my doctor told me I'm one out, one out of 200 people would have basically what I have is how her cartilage was eaten in her nose. Across the street, another lady, you know, was startled and she was like, my doctor told me one out of 200 people would have this same thing. And three doors down on the opposite side of the street, another lady said the exact same thing. Won't disclose her name, but her daughter now is at Spartanburg Regional working there. But all three of these women said the exact same thing of what their doctors told them. And then people started saying, well, you know, when we started having all these different regulations, yeah, I did take those uh, front end payloads and dump in the wells in the community to dispose of them. Everybody started talking and people started seeing maybe there is a pattern here to the deaths in the community. So at that point, it was organizing. I had to go before city council and I organized Regenesis and prior to that, pulling everybody together, that was kind of the crazy thing because the fertilizer plant set in the middle of three different communities. A low-income African-American community that worked at the fertilizer plant, the low-income white mill village, and across the creek was a folks in, Ferris, in Fair Forest Park who worked either in the school system or the hospital system. Everybody had the exact same problems and is like the common denominator was the fertilizer plant. So I took all three of the neighborhoods because I didn't want DHEC coming having a conversation with this community like they have with this community and that community because I saw the pattern across the state how they would have these public meetings and you would say one to one thing, one to another. It's like, nah, let's, let's make it easy for you. Let's just put everybody together and we'll call it this one organization. And that's where Regenesis came from. We almost, died on the vine because folks were, you know, when you get people together, it's one thing about either money, control, or credit. You know, getting credit for almost died that night because they didn't know what name they wanted to be called. And somebody said, Harold, tell them that story about what you said about T.D. Jakes and Regenesis. And that night they jumped on it and said, that's what, you know, we'll embrace. Well, when we did that, it was like, look, only thing you have to do is show up. You don't have to open your mouth. And back then at that time, hardly nobody was going to council. And so we got together and told them, I'm gonna take five slides with the board and we're gonna present to council this landfill that they're the owner operator transporter of. And Mayor Talley, Chief Baines, and folks that were on council had no idea. We showed up, council started at 5.30, made sure the folks were there at five o'clock. We had folks on the outside with picket signs and in the hallway, packed the chamber, we were down on the agenda. They came out of the council chamber and saw the people in the hallway, African-American people at City Hall like that, they ran back in and it's like, what the hell's going on? You know, wh what is he doing? What does he want? And I was like, well, well, we'll wait till you get to us, sir. And they moved us on the agenda to move us up. And I went through the slides and Chief Baines, Lib Fleming were appalled to hear just briefly what I said about that landfill. I didn't embellish anything, just laid out the facts. And a lot of times people are so desperate, desperate people do desperate things in desperate times. You don't have to exaggerate the problems. The facts are gonna speak for itself. And if you lie about it, it's gonna show up anyway. So we laid the facts out and they were like, we gotta do something about this. And it was that night, 1998, they decided that they were gonna take responsibility for that landfill there in Arkwright. And so at that point, environmental justice was kind of like the centerpiece, but there were different silos 
of healthcare, economic, social, and the environment, but it all overlapped. And that's the problem we see today. Everybody's in their own little separate silos. And some of those issues, you know, with the board, when we pulled everybody together, what we needed to address is, okay, okay, what does this look like? Well, from the social side, the crime, because of the abandoned facilities, the poor housing conditions, you know, there are no jobs, the transportation access, there was no such thing because on the other side where the landfill is located, the trains used to park on the tracks. They would sit sometimes over an hour at a time. Well, one time on that other side, the fire department couldn't get in. By the time they got there, the woman and her two kids were charred to the couch. They had burned up in the house. And it was hardly nowhere for the fire trucks to get to, to that house. So this is what the mill village looked like back during that time. It was abandoned. Um, it was basically just like a, a crack haven. Behind me was the field of the old, where the new C.C. Woodson is now, but that's on the old Liberty Street. And that house on the left-hand side, you know, that was kind of like one of the main drug houses at that time. And you could see the AK-47 shells on the street. So kids would walk from Arkwright coming up that street, Liberty Street, to the recreational facility. And so it's like, who's gonna let their child walk through the OK Corral? This is the condition of what the houses and the trailers look like. Behind that was the landfill. Now this is one of the houses that was tested. And when they actually looked in the woman's cabinet to start, you know, with the testing, there's a huge anaconda black snake in her cabinet. Now you see how everything's, you know, at the bottom, so it was easy for the snakes to get in because, you know, in a landfill, you got rats and the snakes, and the snakes are eating the rats, and so the snakes were pretty big out there in Arkwright. And so that was the condition of what we were dealing with. And at that time, and it began to do a lot of the charrettes envisioning with the folks trying to, because at that point, they knew they had a problem environmentally, but it's like, what are we gonna do? And that was the thing Senator Hollings asked me, it's like, okay, you've got everybody's attention, what do you want? We ended up with uh, partnering with the city after that meeting and created this MOU between the nonprofit, the city and the county and the housing authority. Because my thing was, I didn't have time for people to point fingers, passing the buck. It's like, we're gonna put everybody in the room. You don't have to tell me that this other agency is responsible and we're gonna contact them. No, we wanted to cut everything off and put everybody in the room at the same time. And so we created an MOU between the nonprofit because number one, nonprofits don't have the ability to manage grants. And if you see what's going on with a lot of organizations, they spend more time in grant management than the actual project itself. So the county actually worked as the grants manager. And it's like, Harold, you know where the money is. You just go and keep shaking the bush. And so we began to identify the different elements that we wanted to address from housing, transportation, economic opportunities, education, public safety. Pulling all these things together is where going after that $20,000 EPA small grant with a major focus on health, economic development, and cleaning up the environment. When we actually did it, it was kind of like trying to keep the momentum and people coming to the meetings. And so scheduled and put together this uh, forum, instead of getting a grant award, created like this event with the White House to come in. And Al Gore sent his team in and uh, Keith Laughlin, who headed up the Livable Communities Initiative, came in and, and EPA brought the South African delegation in. And so they came and we toured and, th and this picture here is when they were pointing to the chemical plant because it was like, what about that chemical plant? Well, the chemical plant came in because there was no zoning um, in the county. And what was supposed to have been an apartment complex turned into a chemical facility who had no idea that their ethylene oxide tanks were next to a open landfill. Ethylene oxide is like the, the movie in the Ten Commandments, you know how that little plague was going across? Well, the gas, if it goes across and hits a, a, a point of like a little flame or anything, 
it could go back to the source and when it explodes, it takes out everything. So they had six of those tanks there. One could have taken out half of the community, but there were six there. And they had no idea that they were sitting next to a landfill, next to a fertilizer plant. And at that point, that's when I coined it the Devil's Triangle back then. So in August, created the first environmental uh, justice uh, forum on the federal interagency working group, which is what we've had several administrations trying to uh, replicate that process of what we actually did here in Spartanburg. Spartanburg created the first interagency meeting because at that time, once again, I was like, I don't want to hear nobody making excuses. Let's bring everybody to the table. We've identified the elements that we wanted to address the programs to what we needed in our community. And we knew we had a lack of access to health care. So HHS had the federally qualified health centers. We brought all of this in in that August meeting. So usually people get excited because they have a meeting. I was like, okay, we had a meeting, but now what? So that next month we pull our core team back together and we begin to look at the goals. The goals between the community, the state and the federal government were all the same. Even though everybody was upset, everybody had the exact same end goal uh, for the completion of that project as well as on the south side. And you know, the first grant we received was the, uh, the weed and seed grant. But we also, during that time, we received the first congressional earmark where today Regenesis received three congressional earmarks to where neither the city nor the county has received that yet. A nonprofit, some extraordinary people got three earmarks and I didn't fill out a form that you sent in now. It was on a paper napkin in Union Station with a gentleman that works for Senator Hollings who was in Blacksburg. He was like, what do you need? And I took out the pen and on that napkin and started writing out, this is what I would like for you to see if the Senator could get for us. I made a request for about almost 500,000. The request came back answered at 620. By the time it got to Spartanburg, the Senator had bumped it up a little bit more for us and we got 840,000 on that first earmark into Spartanburg to address taking care of the mill village and buying up a lot of the properties that uh, those contaminated properties. And so after that, we went after and we got our first HHS grant in, which got us to federally qualified health center. But I didn't trust the agency for toxic substances and disease registry, because usually what they would say is this little area that I'm in, if there's contamination, usually it's like they would say that the contamination doesn't run past this boundary. And I was like, okay, I don't want you. So I pulled in, which is why I'm glad we have the students here because it was the students from Texas Southern University that came in and did my health survey that that data is what we use for HHS that got us the top grant award that year when Fritz Holling said something had better come to South Carolina. So I'm like, okay, I got you. And we got our first award. So we went from a medically underserved community to now three different counties with a $28 million economic impact now. And I named it after Senator Hollings because one of the funny things was is once we got the grant, some folks in the community wanted to take our federal designation to subsidize the health department. And I was like, that's not gonna happen. The next thing you know, we couldn't find real estate to open. So I got with a group of students from Howard University and they helped us convert this office building, the engineering students, into our first health center that we got open. And I figured if I put the senator's name on it, I won't have any more trouble. And so after that, we ended up going on to South Church Street into this facility because at that time, the hospital saw that we were not competition. We were a safety net. We were keeping people out of the emergency room with non-emergency problems providing a medical home. That's what a federally qualified health center would do. You're gonna pay one way or the other, but being able to provide a medical home for the folks is what we ended up uh, being able to do there. And that's the one that's on Pine Street now. We got our, our agricultural uh, center that's there in uh, Cherokee, our farm workers. And one of the things we had to 
the, the deal with where they had the word migrant in there. Going into the state house, that's when I saw that's a bad word, migrant, because it looks like, you know, undocumented workers. And they were wondering why we can't get the farm workers into the facility. And, and it was kind of like, okay, if you show up at a farm in a SUV looking like ice, I don't think I'm gonna get in your vehicle neither to go to your health center. It looks like you're about to detain somebody. And when we changed that by not understanding culture, we ended up with a huge influx of the farm workers coming to the clinic. But it was just out of ignorance because you think you have a solution and you're not looking at the culture, we ended up not being able to serve anybody. And the, the thing about the federally qualified health centers is that the 340B uh, pharmacy program discounts your prescription drugs at over 60%. So when you look at impacted, disadvantaged communities, this is a huge help of people deciding whether I'm gonna get healthcare or pay my utility bills. And so one of the other grants we went after, I pulled in the Department of Labor to start doing a lot of the construction trade because when we got the $20 million Hope Six grant from HUD, it was like, how can we keep these resources in the community? So we started training people and I plugged in with the Department of Labor and started working with the workforce investment here to get our folks ready. And so this class was an asbestos abatement class that I had a bet with Bill Barnett. I said, like, nobody wakes up wanting to do bad. Give somebody an opportunity. So those folks came in and two of the girls ended up mothers, never working before, went through the class, went through another class of the heavy equipment grading and she became a homeowner. So women were like, okay, if she's never worked before and now she's owning a home, I wanna do that. And it was like a domino effect. These folks here, half of the class went to Katrina and the other half went with the company to the Pentagon to do asbestos abatement work there. And then we got one of the guys that set up his own company. This was back in 2004. That was the Mill Village, that was the public housing. That's the Mill Village now today, which is a HUD 202 senior housing development that we were able to put in back then after getting the acquisition from Senator Hollings to put this in. Now at that time in 2005, six, we were seeing a lot of seniors move back into this area, but there was no place for the seniors. And then all of a sudden you see now that our senior developments are popping up all over Spartanburg and Spartanburg County. And out of that public housing, the unit there at the bottom of that Hope Six, because what we also have is we're the only HUD certified counseling agency here to do the home buyer education, financial literacy, and getting people in that pipeline ready to become homeowners. But that unit at the bottom was the first one that President Clinton actually visited a completed Hope Six. And so coming there, he was shocked when he ended up seeing the facility because having the motorcade go down Church Street and we turned and he was like, how, how far we gotta go? And I was like, Mr. President, we're here. He's like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> this, <laughs> it's like, this is a Hope Six. <laughs> so that's the Hope Six that we have there. And at the top is the new C.C. Woodson from the old one that we had there within the community. And what we did with the class we actually trained folks from the homeless shelter and didn't realize that there were a lot of homeless veterans that we actually got to come in and do the foundations uh, there in the homes, those single family homes. And you know, you hear people talk about affordable housing. I created the Affordable Housing Study Committee in 2007. And what a lot of members thought was when you talk about affordable housing, that you're talking about public housing. And affordability is not the bricks and sticks, it's the financing. And that's the problem that we have is that developers and people have come in and they're building houses that, you know, if that's your big time investment, you know, at least let it look like something, not a, a freaking doghouse. And so what we did later, we came back to the community and it's like, okay, these are the craftsman style homes that we started building. Instead of the brick, it's like they want stone and granite and you know the shakes give it an appearance that something I want to own. So back then I used this stuff called the radiant barrier which they used on the space shuttle. You spray the undercoating and it reduces the attic temperature. 
it was proven in all the houses that we have and none of the folks that one summer when it was like averaging 100 degrees there was a couple in an apartment they would average like 350 to 400 in their utility bill that summer they did not spend over 185 dollars so we had that documented to prove and show so right after that everybody started using lowe's home depot and others this radiant barrier protection to lower attic uh, temperature because you know when you hear people talk about energy efficiency you better check and so that's the we ended up with the grant to go after and get the new C.C. Woodson and the Carolina Panthers did the multi-purpose field and Marcus Lattimore uh, once he ended up with San Francisco hooked up with South First Health or South Health to put the playground equipment in this was right across the street from that that I showed you earlier and so the grocery store complex that we were able to get in with the weed and seed grant which we used a lot of this on the south side because what we did back then we used the the weed and seed for the south side and the north side as well as the hope six to do the scattered site in the north side and when it did the cleanup for the textile mill that's when we did the cleanup for the spart mill that became vcom but the interesting thing about getting this weed and seed grant when they told us we couldn't get any you know anything in this community because of crime well we got the grant well, we didn't get the grant at first. We did the assessment, found out we didn't have enough crime in the community. So I had to go borrow some crime. And how I was able to do that, I gerrymandered and drew in a couple of more public housing complexes in Spartanburg to get enough crime so that we can win the grant because they said nothing could come on to the south side. And when we got this in, the save a lot that's not there now, they went out of business in the state, but Piggly Wiggly's coming in but they became the top grossing store for like 48 months there. Uh, the founders, and the thing about it, we trained a lot of the people to actually do the work in the community that worked here. So not one brick, not one tube of anything was stolen off of that site when they constructed this and even today. So when you actually give people an opportunity to work in their space, they're gonna take care of. But if we had somebody that we were bringing in Nine times out of 10, you would see a brick through one of those windows there because it's like, okay, you're gonna let somebody else come in and they take that frustration out. But there was ownership here. And that's what you have to do is create that ownership in the community. This is what Senator Hollings, one of the other earmarks I got when I told you about how the, um, the trains on the track. So this is the alternate access road off of 295 to get into the community. And that's the actual scattered site Hope Six development that went at Phyllis Goins there in Arkwright. And like I said, it went to the north side and three other spots as far as uh, in this community. I'm gonna speed it up, man. This is another piece from the Department of Education. And the reason I'm showing you this is that today, when people talk about environmental justice, they drop the hammer and the anchor on EPA. And there are 400 programs and other agencies that can go into communities. It's not just EPA and cleanup. How do you holistically rebuild communities? And I was wanting to tap into every agency that we could bring in. So we started this global classroom with the Department of Energy, which we use upstate and the north side uh, Cleveland Academy. And the kids here was doing the digital storytelling with the kids in South Africa. And that's in Pretoria there. And this is one of the kids we took a couple of the public housing students with us over. And one of those kids, he thought he was, I mean, back then he used to always talk about it, but he wanted to be the next Kobe Bryant. And when we were about to take off and fly, you know, he had his hoodie on and, you know, just, you know, I'm like, if you get me detained, I'm gonna kill you when we were in LaGuardia. But when we were there, this kid, you couldn't say anything to him. He actually visited one of the, we let him stay the night at one of the schools. We came back that next day, Ms. Viney, Tony Bell will attest to this story. We went back to pick this kid up and we couldn't find him driving through the campus because we were supposed to go to one of the consulates. And I was like, where is this kid? I'm, I mean, let's just leave him. We'll come back and get him tomorrow. And he was at the gate. We passed him going in. He had his braids pulled back into a little ponytail, a tie on, standing there at attention like he was some soldier. I'm like, what the? So we pull, he jumps in the van, 
And automatically he tells Tony Bell, it's like, Mr. Bell, I know what I want to do now. With my basketball skills, my mom's a single parent, I can use my basketball skills to get a scholarship and you know, go to the university and blah, blah, blah. And he, I mean, you just couldn't stop this kid talking prior to that. It was only one night being outside of Spartanburg, seeing another culture and another environment that opened his eyes. And he has a master's degree now. That's how long this was. But this was another global classroom exchange with our kids and the kids from the Sedan. Our kids, the best and brightest at Spartanburg High School. The kids asked our kids, it's like, you know, our kids were like, they wanted to know about American Idol. Was Beyonce popular? Their kids wanted to know about iCar. And our kids are like, what the hell is iCar? And one of the girls, your automotive research park with BMW, Michelin. And I'm like, this kid is in the sedan and you're sitting here talking about Beyonce and Jay-Z. And so the professors and everybody's like, you know, Dr. Turner, that's your Bradshaw who was dumbfounded. He's like, I can't believe this. But that's how we saw how our kids are so far behind. You got kids on the other side of the world knowing what's in your backyard. So this is a, a commitment to action that President Clinton gave us for the landfill because after we did the cleanup on that landfill, which the city paid the $11 million a cap it, this is the after what that looks like now. And in the distance is the fertilizer plant and the textile mill out. That's, that's not there yet. I'm, I'm trying to hurry up. This kind of gives you a little picture here, because I'm sorry. At the bottom here, this is the chemical plant, landfill, fertilizer plant, another dump, and fertilizer plant, textile mill, and dump at the top. This is a picture of what, and I'm just kind of showing you some of the reuses, because Mr. Fazio, Tom Fazio, came to the State House, talked about how uh, a lot of the golfers, Jack Nichols, Arnold Palmer, and Tiger, was looking at landfills and converting them into PGA courses. And I'm like, okay, I've got a landfill for you in Spartanburg. And he gave me the guy that's actually doing the design, Bo Welling. Bo designs all of Tiger's courses. And so he had just moved to Greenville and decided he would come over to Spartanburg and take a look. He walked through and said, man, you've got the perfect topography here for us to create a course. And I'm like, a golf course in this? And he was like, yes. And he's like, we'll do an environmentally friendly course where you're not going to worry about the fertilizers and the impact and the water usage. He's like, I've, I just want to design something like this. And so this was the design that he put down. That's in front of C.C. Woodson. Had some opposition with folks because uh, they thought that this was going to be competition with the private courses, even though this was going to be a public course. Uh, par three, I think they had nine holes and two uh, Par fives in that, but you know it got held up because folks thought that it was competition against a private club. So, Bob Montgomery, can you help me, sir? This here is a Jimmy Moore from BMW and some kids from Greenville, Jesse Jackson Public Housing Townhomes designed this uh, robot with 40 motors in it. They took a 3D printer from GE created this, and the wind turbines and a rover that kids actually did. These are the kids here. We brought them over when President Obama kicked off his clean energy tour at C.C. Woodson uh, back in uh, 2016. And so another reuse that we're using the former textile mill site was a hydroponics facility that working with um, University of California, Santa Cruz is what we're looking at for the reuse on that site. I'm trying to hurry up through this, man. That's President Obama. And this is where, because of EPA creating this collaborative problem solving DVD where what happened in Spartanburg uh, back during the Obama administration, they're still using it up to now to you look at the collaborative problem solving method and methodology that we use for other communities around the country. Immediately when they put it out, 16 Korean reporters and the Institute of Social Conflict came to Spartanburg, knew more about what was going on in Spartanburg than we did as a model for them to use there in um, South Korea. And that's in front of the fertilizer plant there. And, and so, 
There's Senator Clinton. And this is the, the, the actual model that they came up with, the collaborative problem solving model, the seven step process that the Biden administration is kind of kicking off right now for disadvantaged communities with this whole thing of Justice 40. And so this is what we're currently working to integrate into a lot of the impact of communities that we see out of the $1.7 trillion in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. And so this is where we're actually trying to replicate this because what happened here, it happened on the south side. You see it somewhat going on the north side with VCOM and how that took off. The reusing of the Beaumont Mill that's now uh, the office space for Spartanburg Regional, these sites and these communities can be rebuilt and reclaimed and re rec I promise you this is my last three. This is Victor Mill in Greenville. Took 820,000 in the Recovery Act dollars. Folks talked about it was gonna take three to five million dollars to clean that up. Did that in four months. Brought in, assembled a team, Spartanburg County hired me to go in and do that site. Did that cleanup using the same method of working with the community, community organizing and engagement. That's what it looked like after the 120 days. Over $370,000 was invested back into the community from everything that we were able to do. Or recycled all the concrete, the metal steel, five major change orders, the water tower did not go over budget. Pissed off a lot of contractors because it was like, why do you draw this thing out? You made it look too easy. Well, today, there's a 70 some odd million dollar development sitting on that site. This is what can happen across the country and that's part of what Build Back Better was supposed to look like. But because this is so partisan and how, you know, the, the political landscape right now, you can't get anything done because, you know, you've got one side you know, playing all these games, but I just wanted to show you, take the time, I'm privileged to be here before you, to squeeze an hour out of your uh, close to end time exams, but just proud to be able to show you what has taken place in this collaborative problem solving model to share that with you, that it came out of Spartanburg. So right now, uh, Tom Steyer, who ran for president, billionaire Tom Steyer, he and his wife are working with me to create like a Regenesis Institute. And we've pulled in some major partners to look at uh, pilots in seven uh, areas across the country, five regions, different cultures, to create models because people don't know how to connect the dots. And we're actually having to engage with a lot of the state legislatures to create the Justice 40 oversight. I was telling folks earlier, we created that here, this time last year in South Carolina. Our wonderful legislature decided not to pass it. North Carolina took South Carolina's bill, passed it, and got a, almost a billion dollars in transportation funding off the bat. Delaware passed it. Florida's looking at it. Michigan. So everybody's using South Carolina's model to pull the federal dollars into their states. and so. You know, I just want to thank you for your time, but this is the Regenesis story. I know you've probably heard some different things about how we did what we did and who actually gave birth to me and who are the creators of Regenesis, but you saw for yourself, the, this was a group of people that came together and decided to work to make a difference within their communities. I didn't have a PhD. Those folks on that board didn't have a PhD. Anybody can do the work but we need it especially to students because I cannot tell you the number of students from Clemson, Georgia Tech, Howard, uh, Texas Southern, I'm leaving some out that were a part of this project because everybody's not gonna get a darn federal grant. And this is where universities and students are, I mean, it's the key. I mean, what you can do engaging in these communities uh, I mean, that's the thing I keep telling folks at the White House, now they're starting to get it a little of putting resources into some of the institutions to see if we can get these students into the laboratories in these communities to make these differences. So 
I'm going to be calling especially on you. And I mean, it was refreshing sitting with some of the students at dinner coming here to, to just hear your energy. And I would definitely love to get you engaged. I was not here speaking on behalf, just public disclosure, I was not here speaking on behalf of the White House. I was here speaking as Harold Mitchell in my community. Thank you, sir. Paid for by Harold Mitchell and Bob Dawson. And make, make my disclosure. But seriously, thank you. And uh, I will be looking upon and calling some of you. I know some of you may be graduating, leaving, but we have a long way to go and a lot of work to not only take place in this state, in this community, in this county, but throughout the Southeast and the rest of the country and some of the places that we're gonna be going into outside of this country. So thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you for not throwing anything at me for taking that hour. <laughs> Goodbye. Yes. The question was, were there any uh, continuing efforts of environmental justice uh, here in Spartanburg? Uh, luckily, most of the uh, waste facilities that we see um, are being addressed. Uh, one good thing that came out of what took place here was I created and passed the first environmental justice bill in South Carolina. And South Carolina DHEC basically changed how they do public engagement, community involvement, and really getting engaged with communities. So Myra Reese there at DHEC, uh, she's working pretty strong and hard with their group to get out. Now, are there sites still here? Yes, there are plenty of sites that we know that are uh, still within Spartanburg County and the upstate. And I'm working with the folks in Greenville on two now, but what we see is there's an appetite and this whole thing that uh, if you heard of with opportunity zones, well, when Donald Trump declared opportunity zones as opportunities for redevelopment of Superfund and Brownfield sites, when it was a thing trying to get people to get engaged to clean these sites up, no one wanted to even talk about it. Now, it's the hottest ticket, almost like flipping uh, houses here now. People are looking for Brownfield and Superfund sites and kind of giving communities, buying them out so that they can get it and redevelop because when you look at some of the places like the American Airlines Arena, it was a Superfund site. The New York Giants Meadowlands, that was a Superfund site. There are so many sites that are sports arenas across the country because the incentives, the tax breaks, everything that's uh, stacked on that is very lucrative and attractive right now. So one of the things is being able to work with communities to actually kind of help them with the jewels they have and be engaged in whatever takes place in the transformation of their communities. Harold, I hate to ask this question, but is there any time in the last 10, 20 years that you've taken a nap? I don't know about, I don't know about the rest of the people in this audience, but it, it looks to me like you have spent an awful lot of time working making things happen, and you forgot you needed to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir, can't take that nap. And that was kind of the thing that motivated me, even with the, the health center, was what drove that. You know, I've heard everybody tell me how we got the health center started, but how we got the health center started was being in the 
room when the doctor came in and told my dad that this could have been prevented, you know, prevention if you had just come in. And hearing those words and then to hear the next thing that came out of his mouth that you have at least 35, maybe 40 days top. And my dad was like, 30, 45 for what? And he's like, to live. He's like, you're gonna die. And, and I don't see you making it past 45 days. And it was at that point that I didn't want anyone else to hear that kind of a sentence and to just be seen or having a medical home could have prevented this. And that was kind of the motivation, even when talking to the people in that community who told me that there was nothing wrong in the beginning to where when this investigation started, it's kind of all of this stuff happened at the same time. At the beginning of the investigation, there were like 16 people who either worked at the facility or in the community that died that had me coming to their homes and it's like, you know, they wanted to talk to you. And they would be telling me things on their deathbed like, please don't give up. So hearing that was kind of like a driver to not stop. And coming out of Spartanburg, I'm seeing it everywhere. I mean, I've been on reservations. I've been in the Appalachian region. It's across the country, the exact same thing. So it's kind of, you know, I can't stop because folks helped me between President Clinton and, you know, I mean, just, it's amazing the number of people that I've been engaged with and had conversations with to where, as I was telling them, you know, last year, we had an hour and 15 minute conversation with Bill Gates and three of us to try to figure out how to invest in this country like he's doing in some of the other countries around these source of impacts. So I think the stick to itness can't stop until, uh, you know, the ticker stops, sir. Thank you, ma'am.